Evening, ladies and gents. My name is Simon Brown, founder of Just One Lap, doing this evening's presentation. Welcome to 2020, I suppose. Today, looking ETS, tax-free investing. Uh, we're coming up to the end of the tax year. Put it another way, we're coming to the beginning of a new tax year. Uh, 29 Feb being the end, 1 March obviously being the beginning of the tax year. But let's sort of delve into what is uh, uh, tax-free investing, how that works. So introduced in the 2015 budget by then Finance Minister Nkankla Nene uh, with a 30,000 Rand annual limit. And I'll come to those limits in a moment. March 2016 annual limit was increased to 33,000 a year and lifetime limit remains at 500,000 per individual. Those are important. The tax-free product has a number of restrictions. Uh, the first restriction is you have to put your money into a tax-free sort of nominated account. You can't just take an account that you've got and say, oh, I'm going to make this one tax-free. No, no. You have to, with a, a financial service provider, a stockbroker, whoever it may be, you have to open a tax-free account. And restrictions are, firstly, that currently you're limited to 33,000 Rand per year that you could deposit into this tax-free account. 33,000 per individual. Do not exceed that 33,000 per year, because if you do, SARS will tax you at 40%. Onerous, massively bad. And then, of course, there's also a lifetime limit. When you eventually hit 500,000 over your lifetime of contribution, then your tax-free is totally maxed out. Uh, important points. We're talking tax year, so it runs from March to February is the way that we go. Uh, it's not a calendar year. So if you haven't yet put in your 33,000 for the current tax year, you can, but be careful. What matters is the date the money arrives, not the day you send it. So you've only got a couple of days to go uh, and yeah, you know, it might actually fall into the next year. Um, but come what will be 2nd of March, Monday, New Year, you can put your 33,000 in again and you can reset a new year. You don't have to do the full 33. If you've only got 10 or 5 or 18 or whatever the case may be, you can do it monthly, you can do it ad hoc, however you want. Those are upper limits, not lower limits. So absolutely, if you haven't and you can, max out this year and then aim to max out next year as well. Uh, we've got a budget speech coming up on Wednesday. Uh, Minister Mbueni will be delivering the budget. I do not anticipate any change in the budget from this. I think the minister has other issues, things to worry about. I think tax-free is far from his mind right now. So probably we will stay with that 33 uh, annual limit and the lifetime limit of 500,000. Important, that is per individual. Hey? So if you're a family of four, you know, partners and uh, two kids, uh, you can do four times 33,000, which is 132,000 for a family of four. And that's a chunk, eh? I mean, this, this starts to add up, you know, 33 looks small, 132, yo, now we're starting to get to some real numbers uh, in that space. So there is no tax at all, and, and this is not insignificant, and I will show you some slides of that in a moment. So no dividend withholding tax. Remember what we have. A company is in the business of trying to make a profit. At the end of their financial year, they have made a profit, hopefully, and they take some of that profit and they give it back to the owners of the business, the shareholders. That's me and you. And that is what we refer to as a dividend. And that is subject to dividend withholding tax, 20% tax. So you're getting the profits back, but you're paying 20% tax. No dividend withholding tax in a tax-free account. No capital gains tax. You buy something uh, and you sell it a little while later and you've made yourself a profit uh, and you are then subject to capital gains tax. The first 40,000 every year is exempt. So if you only made 39 grand capital gain, no worries. Anything above 40,000, 40% 40 of it gets added to your income and taxed accordingly. So the max potential tax in CGT, if you're at that top bracket and you had more than 40,000, you could be paying as much as 18% on CGT. No income tax if you're trading shorter term. Typically, SARS says if you buy and hold for longer than three years, it's CGT, less than three years, and they're going to bust you with income tax. No tax on interest. I'm going to come back to this because there's some important point here. Um, but there's no tax on interest earned as well. Interest is taxable above certain thresholds. That is exempt. In essence, we pay VAT on brokerage. 
And then we pay state duty. Uh, when you die, your your, your, your tax-free account will be wound up. Any profits that you've made within your tax-free account will go into your estate with no tax liability. So the executor of your estate will sell the positions, move the cash into your, into your uh, estate, and there won't be any tax on that. But there is potentially estate duty. Of course, you're dead, so you've got way bigger problems to worry about, but there is an estate duty tax. There is also foreign dividends. Now, there are a lot of offshore ETFs that we can invest into, and I'm going to come a lot more back to what ETFs in a moment. Don't worry about that. A lot of offshore ETFs, and what they do is they will pay us dividends paid out in foreign jurisdictions, America, Europe, Asia, wherever that might be. And we've got tax treaties with that, so we get some of that uh, tax that we pay in the dividend back as an individual, but the, there is still tax liable, typically around about 15% on those dividends. We can't claim that back. Quite simply, the IRS and the Exchequer in the UK and all the other different uh, jurisdictions, they have no interest in our tax product and, and the like. So there is some slippage in terms of dividend tax on foreign holdings. Now, it's going to be small. Let's call that tax 15%. Let's, say there's a, let's be generous and call it a 3% dividend yield that's been paid. Uh, in, in essence, that's 0.5% that we're going to lose some slippage. It's not zero. Uh, you know, 0.5%. If, if, if there's 0.5% sitting on a table, then it can be mine or yours. Every time I want it to be mine. Let's not kid ourselves. But the fact of the matter is, is there is going to be some slippage there. But, you know, don't stress it. Or if you do want to stress it, then don't put your foreign ETFs into a tax-free account. Uh, put property, put local, et cetera, et cetera. So, you know, I, I don't worry about it. It's, it's, you know, it's one of those things. It doesn't, to my mind, detract sufficiently from foreign ETFs in a tax-free account for me to not want to hold those ETFs. Transfers are allowed since 1st of March 2018. So you've got a tax free account with one provider, you want to move it to another provider. You absolutely can. Firstly, let's understand that you don't just sell what's with provider one, take it and move it to provider two. You need to do a proper transfer process so that it retains its tax free status. Because if you just sold and took the money out, SARS was like, well, cool, that money is no longer tax free. So what happens is that you've got the ability to transfer, but contact the company you're leaving, contact the company you're moving to, there will be forms to fill out, it'll take a couple of days, it'll happen seamlessly, there might be some costs from the company you are exiting from. Why would you transfer? Uh, cheaper products. You might find your product is, is overly expensive um, and you've, there's a competitor who offers a cheaper option. You might have the wrong product. You know, some folks have gone into pure cash products at the banks. Now, for some people, cash is the right product, but, you know, really that is a retirement, you know, when you're in retirement, as opposed to when you are investing. Certainly, if you're young, if you're, you know, 20s, 30s, tech, even in your 40s, maybe your 50s, you know, one cash. And remember, you've probably got cash in an emergency fund, so you've got some there already. You've got cash in any retirement annuity pension, cash or near cash, it might be bonds. Um, you might also be moving for product range. Now, there might be limits in what you can buy at your current provider. Some providers are restrictive as to what you can buy, um, and I don't like those restrictions, and frankly, you might not like them either, in which case you might want to transfer. Again, I stress, speak to the company you're exiting from, speak to the company you're moving to, get the documentation, and what may happen, and I've heard this happen for more than a few people, is that when you do the transfer, SARS then hits you with a 40% penalty for the money you moved in. And you, know, you haven't actually deserving of that 40% penalty. What's happened is that, quite frankly, there's been an admin error somewhere. And in every case where this has happened, the person's gone back to, to the providers, got the documentation, gone back to SARS, and SARS has been awkward. OK, sorry, no 40% penalty. So if you get the penalty, I mean, don't stress. Be angry, because someone messed up admin, but don't stress it. Contact everyone. It will be wavered as long as you have followed the process. You can, however, of course, withdraw money whenever you want. You, you can take your money and run at any point you like. But he has a couple of important points. Firstly, this really is designed to be a long-term investment. In an ideal world, your tax-free account is the last money that you ever get to spend. And that last month of your life, you draw out your tax free and you just go large. You know, you, you, I was going to say you hire a Concorde, but 
I don't know. I mean, are there Concords anymore? I think they're parked somewhere. I don't know if you'd be able to find a pilot. But this is the last money that you ever want to spend. This is designed for decades. But if something truly life-shattering happens, and it does, life throws us curveballs, and it's like this is the only option you have, well, you can take that money. You can. So it is possible. Also very important that buying and selling within your tax-free is not a withdrawal. So you put your 33000 in, and you bought a particular ETF, and you liked it. And a while later, you said, no, I don't like that ETF anymore. So you sell it within the tax-free. That's not a withdrawal. That's just transacting within the ETF, within the tax-free uh, uh, product. And you can do that as often as you want. There are absolutely no limitations on how often you can buy and sell within your tax-free. You could do it 100 times a day. I, I mean, your stockbroker is going to love you, right? Because they're going to make a an absolute bomb on the fees, but be that as it may, you absolutely can if you want to. Here's the key thing on withdrawing money, however. It reduces your lifetime limits, and here's what I mean. You've got a lifetime limit of 500,000. You've put 30,000 in so far, and your lifetime limit has then dropped to 470,000. You take that 30,000 out. That's fine, you can take it, it's yours, and it is tax-free of any profits. However, your lifetime limit remains 470000 You don't re-get that money to add back in. It's not like a revolving door in a sense. So re re withdrawing that money reduces your lifetime limit. And that's why you really want to put money in here that you don't take out. You know, with a retirement annuity, you can't access that money, except for death and divorce or age 55. So you're absolutely locked in. And we've kind of got, as a... You know, as an investment community, we've kind of, that's hardwired into our brain. We, we understand that with the, with the retirement annuity. With the tax-free, we can, but we should have that same thinking that, yes, we can, but no, we won't. Unless, as I say, there's a proper absolute curveball. You know, I don't know, you're about to be living on the pavement, um, and it would be silly to be living on the streets if you've got a pile of money in your tax-free. Then, okay, you, you've been thrown a solid curveball, and, and this is perhaps not the worst idea. Uh, local returns, <laughs> being very modest. I'll show you a picture in the next slide. Offshore returns being great. Our range of ETFs has been expanding and shrinking. And if you want to get uh, Christia hot under the collar, ask her about the shrinking part of the ETFs. We currently have 64 ETFs we can use in tax-free. So let's park a moment and say, hang on, what's an ETF? So I said to you there's a bunch of limitations, and some of them are in terms of how much money you can put in every year and over your lifetime. One of the other limitations is you can't put just anything into a tax-free account. You can put collective investment schemes and ETFs fall under collective investment schemes. What you can't do is put individual stocks. So you, and, and the reason is quite simple. Reserve Bank is terrified that you're going to put African Bank or Steinhoff or EOH or, or you know, Tongard, any one of the multitude of fallen angels that we have and your tax-free account loses plus 90% and is decimated. So what they say is it must be an ETF. And an ETF is a basket of shares. Very similar to unit trusts, but also very different. So they both fall, unit trusts and ETFs, are part of the Collective Investment Scheme Act of Parliament, as are hedge funds, but let's park them, let's ignore them for now. The difference is, is that a unit trust has a bunch of smart managers who say, you know what, the market is going up a certain percentage and we will do better than the market. We will give you a better return in the market. And that's deeply attractive. If the market is doing 12% and your unit trust manager can do 15, an extra 3% over a lifetime of investing is significant. The problem is they can't. You go to SPIVI, Standard, Poor, Standard & Poor's Indexation versus Active. So Google SPIVI, S-P-I-V-A. They do a South Africa report and many others around the world. And that shows quite simply that only 15% of the unit trusts beat the market. So only 15% actually deliver anything above that 12% number I mentioned a moment ago. And that is one in six. The question is, how lucky are you feeling when you're trying to now determine which unit trust to buy? The ETF comes along and says, you know what, beating the market is really lacquer, but one in six, those odds, truthfully, suck. You've got a one in six odd of picking the unit trust that will beat the market. But what do we know? So I, I no longer, I don't work for a bank anymore. When I did work for a bank, I had data from 1960 to date. Well, it was then going through to 2010. And if I looked at any 20-year period, and I know 20 years, long time, but investing, 
is long term. If I looked at any 20 year period, your best investment was in the stock market. It beats cash, it beats inflation, it beats property, it beats commodities, it beats everything. In, in the short term, who knows who will win? But in the long term, shares win. So the ETF industry says, so this is the best asset class long term, but to, trying to decide which shares within that asset class is very hard. So why don't we just buy the market? So what they do, for example, we've got a top 40 ETF. They go buy, literally, the 40 biggest shares on our JSE, Johannesburg Stock Exchange. And they take those 40 shares, and they put them in a basket, and they sell that basket to you. So what you've got is a guarantee that you would get the same performance that our stock market does. And you could get the S&P 500, and they go buy the 500 shares there and give it to you in a basket. The, the Ashburton 1200, and they give you the 1200 global shares and put that in a basket. The MSCI Developed Market Index, which has got 1,600 shares in it. What you get is the whole market. And the beauty of this is that you've got diversification. I mentioned Steinhoff a moment ago. If you held Steinhoff as an individual share, you've lost more than 90% of your money in that investment. Yet in my basket, when Steinhoff went down, what was it? Was it 20, December 2017? Yeah. When Steinhoff collapsed that, 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 that Wednesday morning, it, I owned it. I owned it in my ETF. Steinhoff in of itself, on that day, on one day, did about 70% down. My ETF was down maybe half a percent. Why? Because Steinhoff was only about 2 or 3% of that index. So I had the worst share to hold that entire year, perhaps the worst share to hold at ever any point on our market. And I lost about half a percent. And it then gets booted out and off we go. Because what happens is these indices rebalance. So those 40 shares are not constant. Steinhoff collapses, it gets booted out. Ditto with Tongart. Ditto with Aspen. And as those get booted out, the new winners come in. The, the, the miners, Sabanya Stillwater, Capitec, those come in. So it's a, an index is a self-cleaning corrective tool in a sense, constantly making sure that it holds the betters and not the dogs. It's not perfect, but what it does is it gives you the market return. And as I said, over the long term, the best asset class is the market. So you get the best return. And then the beauty is they do it really, really cheap. You know trusts are charging 1, 2, 2.5%. Two We've got ETFs in our market charging 0.1%. Our expensive ETFs are charging just under 0.9%. And that difference in fees is huge. It's absolutely massive. It makes a difference in our life. And we are seeing those fees drop. We're seeing the total expense ratios drop. That is the cost. So when I say the ETF costs you 0.1%, what I mean is the total expense ratio. There's obviously costs by the provider in running this ETF. And what they simply do is they then take those fees and they charge them to us as the beneficiary of the fund. And, and they're small. I, I, you know, first unit trust I bought, I paid 5 or 6% in the 90s, plus performance fees. Fortunately, well, not fortunately, it didn't perform, so I didn't pay performance fees. Now we're haggling over 0.1 here, 0.2 there, et cetera, et cetera. So the fees are great. What we're also seeing is that brokerage fees are dropping and admin fees. So you've got a total expense ratio from the provider of the ETF. When you're buying and selling ETFs, you need to pay a fee. We have now got uh, as low as the Standard Bank is dropping their fees to 0.15% uh, from the 1st of March. Uh, we've got Absurd 0.2. We've got a bunch of people at 0 0.25, uh, 0 0.4, 0 0.5, etc. And then the third fee we will pay is a platform or administration fee. And again, a lot of those are now sitting at zero or very close to zero. And that, you know, my favorite fee is always going to be zero because, you know, we understand the power of compound interest, right? Interest on interest on interest compounding and making us richer and richer and richer. Well, what we have with fees is it's the inverse. It's compounding out of your life, out of your wealth. So we want that to be as small as possible. I promised you a chart. The one there on the left is the S&P 500. So that is the 500 biggest American companies in the world. And on the right is the top 40, which is the 40 largest South African companies. And you can see quite simply that the S&P has been on an absolute stormer over those Two years, sorry, five years, it's up about 70%, whereas our market over the same period is up about 
oh, from generous 7%. There's no dividends into this picture, but nonetheless. A couple of points I want to touch here. Look at that collapse in the S&P in 2019, the last quarter, down almost 20%. Lots of panic. Lots of the world is ending. Lots of we must get out because everything is going horribly wrong. And if you did exit, well, let's say you exited at around 2,500. It's now almost 3,400 on the S&P. Uh, that is, it's risen a third since that. Markets will collapse at times. There will be small little collapses like that of the last quarter of 2018. There will be giant collapses like we saw in 08, 09. But what they do is they recover. My advice is stop watching. Stop stressing it. Stop worrying about it. Stop turning it on and looking at it every five minutes or every hour or something like that. This is a long-term investment. Check it once a year. You're watching Channel 412. Turn it off. With the exception, if I'm on Channel 412, do not turn it off. But other than that, you know, it, it, the market in the short term is a crazy, crazy place. The market in the long term makes you money. Touching on the South African market here. So everyone thinks this is SA Inc. and ESCOM. And in part, it is. But truthfully, that top 40 index, about two-thirds of their profit come from beyond the borders of South Africa. Yes, they listed in South Africa, but these are global businesses. They're doing business all over the world. Now, a bunch of that is actually going into the rest of the continent, and the rest of Africa has been a fairly tough place as well. Some more than others, you know, Angola's had hyperinflation and the like, and there's been some tough spots around there. But a lot of people are like, oh, I wouldn't touch the South African market. It's terrible, it's ugly, it's horrible, etc., etc. Maybe, but do you truly understand what the South African market is? It's also, excuse me, ridiculously cheap. And when I say ridiculously cheap, about as cheap as it's been in 10 or 15 years, maybe longer. The point being is I would have made that statement a year ago. A year ago, if I said to you that our market is ridiculously cheap, it was true. And now it's just cheaper. So, you know, what I'm trying to say here is that different markets will have their day in the sun. Don't like, oh, never South Africa, only S&P. There, there have been times. There have been, you know, like it, the, the, the decade after the dot-com crash, South Africa did, as a market, way better than the US markets, better than the FTSE markets, better than the European markets, swings and roundabouts. So let's get to some numbers. I love numbers, uh, totally geek on this. If you want the spreadsheet, uh, it will be on the website. You can download it and play with it, justonelap.com slash power hour, and you will find this video and you can download the spreadsheet because maybe you disagree. I have to make some assumptions and maybe you dislike my assumptions you are welcome to come and make your own assumptions. So here's my first one, and I credit this chart to Stealthy Wealth and uh, Patrick Mackay, and I don't actually know which or either or who, but one of them or both of them have looked at this. So first, some data, 7% real return, no inflation, 4% drawdown. So what do I mean by 7% real return? I mean, that is your return after costs and after inflation. So if the market goes up 11% and inflation is 4%, you've got a 7% real return. It means that the number I'm looking at in 65 years' time is in today's money. Because otherwise, I tell you, you're worth 926 trillion rand, and you're like, well, that sounds like a lot, but is it? Truthfully, don't know. So I always strip inflation out of these numbers so that we're looking at like with like. What we've got here is a child is born today, and we put 33,000 into their tax-free account on the day of their birth, and we never do anything again, and we come back in 65 years. In 65 years' time, that 33,000 that you put in is paying them 100,000 rand a year, no tax. No tax at all because you're in a tax-free account. And that's huge. Now, I know what you're saying. 100,000. Nah, not enough to live on. Agreed. But let's be honest. All you did was put in 33,000 once. Let's say you did that every year for 15 years to get to that half a million rand. So now you've got 15 years of 33,000. Now you're getting over a million rand per year, no tax payable. And all you did was between age zero and age 15 was max out their tax free every time, don't touch it, come back at age 65. You know what the huge power here is if we do this? Is that during your working career, you don't have to save because your parents, your guardians, someone, someone you loved you a lot, put away half a million rand for you up to the age of 15. Your retirement is now sorted, assuming you can live in a million rand a year in today's money. And that's a lot of cash, eh? So now during your 
adult life, your earning life. You don't need to be saving for investments, which frees you up to perhaps take a slightly less strenuous and w less well-paying job. It frees you up to perhaps support your parents or, or maybe, yeah, I don't know, your siblings. Although why you got the money and your brother or sister didn't is a question you need to ask your parents. But it, it is hugely powerful. And a quick point, I've used the 4% drawdown rule. And what that means is at age 65, you've got a pile of money and you take out 4% a year. And what that then does is it means that this money keeps on growing with inflation and it means that you can constantly, until you die, take out that 100000 per year and you will die leaving a giant pile of money. And now you've created generational wealth. That money is, in today's money, 2500000 million. And you take down 4%, which is 100000 a year, and that 2500000 million goes down by your 100000 but goes up by 7% real return and actually gets bigger and bigger and enables you to carry on going. Now some folks will quibble and say it should be 3%, it should be 5%. Generally we look at the 4% rule, drawdown rule. So there's one example of 33,000, day a child is born, that's the power of tax-free. But let's really look at these numbers. Now again, I have to make assumptions. So assumption number one, you are getting a 2.5% dividend yield per year. Remember that dividend that you paid, that part of the profits that goes back? You owned an ETF there are 40 companies in there. Those 40 companies make a profit. They pay a dividend. The ETF issuer takes that dividend, holds it for you, and then every six months pays it out to you. If they've received any interest, they pay that as well. A dividend yield is just taking that amount we've received and expressing it as a percentage of the value of the ETF. So I'm received a 2.5% dividend yield per year, 6% real growth, in other words, after inflation. So if inflation is 3.5%, market did 9.5%, you got a 6% real return. I'm assuming you maxed out your contribution every year until you hit your 500,000, and I'm assuming you kept it invested for a 40-year period, and I know some of you like me are a little bit older, and 40 years takes us into very, very old, and probably in a box in the ground, but for many here, if you're in your 20s, 40 years takes you into, into your 60s. If you're in your 30s, it takes you into your 70s. And then I'm using, again, the 4% rule down rule. So what do the numbers tell me? That tax-free account becomes 7.7 .7 million in today's money. It pays out 310,000 a year, tax-free, no tax liability at all. You're getting 310,000 per year. Is that enough to live on? Depends. I mean, that, that's up to you. Maybe you and your partner each get it and it's 620. Maybe it isn't enough to live on, but all you did was spend 15 years maxing out 500,000. What about your discretionary? What about your retirement and pension and provident and all of those? A non-tax-free account is worth 6.6 .6 million, which generates you 217,000 a year, because remember, you've got less money, 6.6 .6 versus 7.7, .7, and the reason for that is because of tax on the dividends, and when you get your payout, it's, li it's got subject to capital gains tax. So instead of 310, you're getting 217. In other words, the person in the tax-free account gets 40 plus percent more per year to live on. Giant. Absolutely giant. Here's the number that really, really hit me. So the difference between the two is 7.7 .7 versus 6.6 .6 million. And the only tax that's happening within that you're saving is the dividend withholding tax on your dividends. So if you are in a non-tax-free account, that 2.5% dividend yield effectively pays a 20% tax and becomes a 2% dividend yield. So the difference is half a percent. That half a percent is 1.1 million czar in today's money. And that's why the little numbers matter so much. That's why when the unit trusts were ripping us off at 5 or 6%, we were getting slaughtered and they were driving luxury German sedans and taking exotic holidays. It's why there's still pressure. I mean, the, the war on fees has largely been won, but there's still pressure. There's still ETFs out there at 0.86 and 0.6 plus, etc. percent. And if you can pull those down over the long term, the impact is humongous. Now, I know some of you are saying haven't got 40 years. I mean, I know there's lots of if, buts, and maybes. As I said, if you want to fiddle with it, uh, just onelap.com slash power hour. You can go and grab the, the spreadsheet. So some burning questions. I get asked questions all the time by peeps uh, over, the, over, the, over the years around tax-free. There's a couple that come up every time, so let's quickly hit those. Can I open one for my kids? Yes, you can. 
Technically, if the kid is under seven, you can't use a stockbroker, you need to use a financial services provider, but you certainly can open for your kids. But here's the point, is that at age 18, this money goes to the kid. It is now the kid's money, and I remember being 18, and I remember mostly sex, drugs, and rock and roll. I remember, as a 19-year-old, going to the ATM, putting my card in, trying to draw 10 rand, and the bank saying, sorry, sir, you don't have 10 rand. So it is, you can open for your kid. The point is, I suppose, that if you start this at day zero, you've got 18 years to convince the kid to be responsible with their money. But at the age of 18, it's their account, it's their money, they can do whatever they want with it. That's your call and your parenting. Is it worth starting if I'm too old? Yes, absolutely it is. A hey, couple of things. Firstly, how long are we going to live for? Yeah, the first person alive to, who lived to 150 is probably already alive. I, I think it's my mother-in-law, but anyway. So, I mean, we're, we're living longer. Now, let's say you open a tax-free account today, and tomorrow you get hit by a bus and you die. Okay, awkward, unfortunate, very sorry for you, tragic, and you got no benefit. But let's say you open it today and you live a year, five years, 10 years, 20 years, 30 years, 40 years. You know, a 70-year-old person... 50 years ago was pretty much at the end of their life expectancy. A 70-year-old person today is now expected to hit 90. Half of 70-year-olds will get into their 90s. So we are living a lot longer. So why not open if it's old? I mean, what happens is, every year, finance minister stands up in parliament in late Feb and basically announces tax increases, basically taking money out of our pocket. This is the one place where finance minister puts money back into our pocket. Don't care how old you are, grab that money. Grab your share of that money. Treasury is giving you cash. You should be taking it. I put in 33,000, but dividends pushed me over. So I get this question a truckload. I put in my 33,000 and I got a dividend of a thousand rand. Now I'm at 34,000. Whoa, I'm over the limit. I'm in trouble. I'm going to be penalized. No, you're not. The restriction of 33,000 per year and 500,000 for a lifetime is on money deposited in. It is not on the growth within. That extra thousand rand that you got is growth. It's not punishable by anything. That's the purpose of these accounts. So as it's growing, don't stress it whatsoever. And can you have more than one account? Yes, you can have as many tax-free accounts as you like, but understand that limit of 33,000 per year is to you, the individual, not per account. Don't go and open 10 accounts and put 33,000 into 10 of them because nine of those will be penalized at 40%. You can open 10 of them and put 3,300 into each. That's perfectly legit. But that limit of 33,000 is to the individual, not the account. You can have multiple accounts, but you still can't exceed that 33,000 per year. So then what to buy? Another burning question. So the point is, and a moment ago I was dissing the active managers and saying that only 15% of the active unit trust managers are able to beat the market. What we're doing with an ETF is we've got to be careful that we're not being active. In other words, we're picking the different ETFs and we're making little bundles and baskets and we're trying to beat the market. And we might do that, but we might also underperform it. So, Christia and I, we did a podcast, Christia's podcast, The Fat Wallet Show, and we, uh, about a year, two years ago or so, looked at the idea of one ETF to rule them all. In other words, just buy one broad-based global ETF. And that's what both Christia and I now do. We just buy one simple global ETF. Why? Because the global economy is going to be growing. Always has, always will. Ah, there will be short periods where it isn't. But... Much as I showed you that chart between the S&P 500 and the top 40 a moment ago, the U.S. has beaten us hands down for the last five years, and there's times when we've beaten them hands down. How do we know who's going to win for the next five or 10 or 40 years? Short answer, we don't. So what do we do? Well, we know the world is growing, so we just buy a broad-based global ETF, of which there are four that we like. First one, the Ashburton 1200 issued by Ashburton. It tracks 1,200 largest companies around the world. It does include about 7% of emerging markets. It does not include Africa. Of course, this is a little bit weird, right? Because Apple is a US S&P 500 stock, the biggest in the index. 
but Apple sells iPhones. I mean, some of you in the audience here today have Apple products. My laptop is an Apple product, and we are, in South Africa, we are an emerging market. So what I'm saying here is it's direct emerging market. I'll come back to GlowDiv in a moment. Uh, we've got the Satrix World Index, which is the MSCI developed market. It's about 1,600 shares, and it's developed markets only. So no emerging markets whatsoever. whatsoever. We've got the Signia 500, which tracks the S&P 500, which is an American index, and about 60-odd percent of the income comes from within America. But, of course, a bunch of that, again, Apple iPhones. You know? they're, they're, they're American companies, but they're global businesses. Now, in the case of both the world and the S&P 500, there are actually a couple of different ETFs we can buy. I've picked those ones because they are the cheapest in terms of the total expense ratio. In terms of your fee, they are the cheapest. And then I have the GlowDiv. So GlowDiv is from CoreShares. Uh, it's the Global Dividend Aristocrat ETF. It doesn't focus on high dividend payment. What it focuses is a long dividend track record. So for American companies to be included, they need to have a 25-year track record of paying dividends. 25 years. And what that means is we low on tech because Apple 25 years ago was bankrupt. Uh, Facebook, Google Alphabet didn't exist 25 years ago. So there's a lot less tech in there and a lot more consumer staples. So it will be at this point in time when tech is driving the world, that index will not be doing so great. But when things are collapsing and suddenly tech is out the window and the shares are crashing, this one would crash less simply because it has less tech holding. It's got toothpaste companies. You know, the world is ending. We might not be replacing our iPhone, but we're surely brushing our teeth. Uh, at this point, you folks are all supposed to agree with me. We still, yes, yes, excellent. We're still brushing our teeth. So it is in many ways, it can be viewed as a lower risk. Now, I asterisk that risk part because you're investing in the stock market and in the short term, stock markets are risky. But in the long term, it's got more of the sort of consumer staples, less of the high flyers. It also has about 7% EM. It also has no Africa. I own two of these. The Signia 500 I own as a trading position. I trade ETFs. I've held it for, oh, I think sometime in the third quarter of last year of 2019. And then the SGEQ is my stock standard. I buy it every month of the debit. And then I also put my tax free into it. And I will be on the 2nd of, yeah, 2nd of March. I will be putting my 33,000 into the Ash GEQ for my tax-free account. So what we're looking for is a broad-based ETF. You could go local or offshore. We like the idea of offshore. There is one caveat, one risk to these offshore ETFs, right? And that is quite simply, so what they do, how this works is the issuer, be it Ashburton, uh, CoreShares, Satrix, Signia, or any of the issuers of, off of those offshore ETFs, they take your Randellas, convert them into US dollars and buy the shares. Shares go up, you make money. Rand weakens, you make money. Because you're in a dollar-based investment, but it's coming back to you as a Randella, czar-based investment. What that also does mean is that if the Rand strengthens, the value of your ETF will come down. Now, over the short term, the Rand is crazy. Over the long term, the Rand weakens against the US dollar by about 2.5% a year doesn't look like that, but that is how it runs. And that is, in essence, the inflation differential between South African inflation and American deflation, uh, 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 inflation. But, you know, we can see the RAND is currently 15 as, as we're standing here this evening. The, could the RAND go to 20? Sure. Could it go to 10? Yes. People tell me it can't. It can. Here's my real-world example. December 2001, 21st of December, our RAND hit 1361 against the US dollar. It then proceeded to strengthen to 575. It never got back to 1361 until Nkankla was fired in December 2015. Even in the crisis of 08, 09, we didn't breach that 1361. So if you had taken money over at that point, December of 2001, it was 14 years before the Rand was back to that level. Don't stress that, because what you're doing with an ETF is you're buying constantly. You're buying every month, you, every quarter, every year. You're getting that RAND cost average. And over the long term, the currency will work in your favor. 
You can add some spice if you want. There are tech ETFs such as NASDAQ and uh, uh, one investor has got the uh, S&P uh, tech index. You could go get some mid cap. What you can't do is add individual commodities. So you can't put rhodium in or gold or anything like that. And again, the reason is simple. Uh, Treasury is worried that you put rhodium in and the rhodium price collapses and you lose a vast truck amount of money. You can get cash and bonds. Now, <coughs> excuse me. You can get cash or bonds. There is a place for that. Uh, my view is that cash or bonds is really when you are in retirement. When you are in retirement, you want the next five years living expenses in cash or near cash, such as a bond. If you're not needing money cash in the next five years, you don't need cash or bonds. But we do have local and offshore. But also remember your other investments. You've got a retirement annuity, a pension or provident fund, maybe a preservation fund. You've got discretionary investments. Have a holistic view. You know, one of the reasons a lot of peeps are using their uh, uh, tax-free accounts for offshore ETFs is because of Reg 28 that exists within their retirement annuity. So have that holistic view of all of your investments. Cash in of itself. So remember, if you're earning interest and you're under 65, the first 23,800 rand of interest per year is tax-free. If you're over 65, the first 34,500 of interest per year tax-free. Thereafter, it gets added to your income and taxed accordingly. This values have not changed from 2015, and I think Treasury is not going to change them. I think Treasury's view is quite simply is that if you are a big interest earner, use your tax-free account for cash. You know, I don't have cash in my tax-free because I look at it as a drag. But the point being is, is that if you're in the right space, then absolutely. But don't put all of it. Make sure that outside of your tax-free, you're earning your first 23800 or uh, 34500 of interest. Interest that earned above that, put in your tax-free account, and then you can get more tax-free interest. Of course, the trick is 33000 a year. It's going to take you a while, but nonetheless, it is there. It works. Property-ish. So South African property is about the worst performing sector I have seen in a very, very long time. I own some property ETFs, uh, some locals. The benefit of property is that distributions are taxed as income because the way a REIT is set up, Real Estate Investment Trust, any distribution that comes through is not a dividend taxed at 20%. It is added to your income and taxed at your tax rate. So quite possibly, you are paying well in excess of 20%. I mean, if you're in the really, really top, earning a million and a half a year, you're paying 45% on your distributions from property. So for that reason, property is a great place. Tax-free is a great place to put property into. We've got a couple of local, the new core shares. Uh, there's the Satrix property. There's the Cloud Atlas, which focuses on Africa. The AMIRE is an Africa excluding South Africa property index. Uh, two offshores, the Signia property, and then there is a one from One Invest, the ETF GRE, Global REIT. There's a lot of property out there. I like property as an asset class. It's been a rough couple of years for property. My view is quite simple, is the buildings are physically there. Now we can debate valuations, we can debate loan levels, etc., and quality of buildings, but I can tell you they're not like the picture there. I went and found one of the worst pictures of property I could. We're in Santon this evening. You look out the windows of these beautiful buildings in Santon. Many of those are in, such as the Satrix property, the Core Shares property as well. What about monthly versus lump sum? So this is the one question I get all the time. I've got X amount of money. Should I put it into the market today or should I do it over a period of time? The math is simple. Put it in today. Put that money in today. Why? Because markets spend more time going up than they do going down. However, you might put it in today and tomorrow the market might crash 30% and then you'd wish you'd never heard of me. So what matters is if that is going to stress you, if putting money into the market today and watching it lose 30% over the next month because of a, of a market crash is going to make you not sleep well at night, then don't do a lump sum because sleeping is important. Truthfully, sleeping is more important than being rich. Being rich is lacquer, but if you haven't slept in 10 years, you can't do anything with that money you've got. So if you're stressed about markets and you're worried, and oh, well then do it monthly. And the strategy I use is quite simple. You've got a pile of money. Say to yourself, I will, every month, every quarter, whatever the case is, over a year or two years, invest this money. In other words, decide on what days 
over the next year or two that you will invest this money and then do it regardless. Don't, on the day you're supposed to invest it, say, oh, but it might be cheaper tomorrow. It might. It might also be more expensive. In other words, you got 100,000. You're saying, an investor, so over 10 months, on the fourth of every month, I will put 10,000 into that ETF, no questions asked. Of course, if you haven't got lump sum, well, then you do monthly or ad hoc. You know, I, I'm fortunate I can, on the 2nd of March, put 33,000 into my tax-free. I will. I will invest it immediately. If you can't, then that's how it is. Circumstances are you will invest monthly. What about trading? I mentioned earlier that you can buy and sell as often as you want within your ETF port uh, your tax-free portfolio. You can. There are no implications. And then there's a big attraction to, well, why don't I trade it? And certainly, I know some stories of people who have traded their ETF port uh, their tax-free portfolio and done very well. I also know stories of people who have traded their tax-free portfolio and done less well. You can transact as often as you want. That's not considered a, w a sale. It's not a withdrawal. But unless you are a hot trader, just buy, invest, hold, come back in 40 years and create wealth. So recap. First question is who should have one? And the honest answer is everybody. We can debate the kids. And that's, that's, that's a personal issue. And I'll let that up for the, for the parents and the audience to decide. But everyone should have one. Your age is of no import. Because you're old is not an excuse not to. Because you're young is not an excuse not to. The short answer is SARS is giving you money. Grab it. Ignore short-term market gyrations. In the short term, the market is a ISIL. It does crazy things. I mean, right now we've got the coronavirus. And what's our market done? Gone up. It's like corona, yeah, don't care. What do you mean don't care? There's 2,000 dead people. 75,000 infected. The market seldom makes sense. Keep it simple. Complexity seldom wins the day. And watch your costs. Lower, always better. Always better. And then the question is, what order do you do? Fill up your tax-free investment first, your 33000 Then fill up your retirement annuity, which is capped at 27.5% of your income, or 350000 whichever is lower. And if you've still got money, then buy some discretionary investment. Tax-free, pension, discretionary. Remember that 27.5 or 350,000 includes any contribution your company might be making as well. Ladies and gents, we will park it there. Appreciate the time this evening. Uh, I'll take some questions after if anyone has got them. I'm going to go back. If you, you know, tax-free is not rocket science. It's incredibly important. It's immensely powerful. I showed you those numbers. Please utilize it. Many thanks to Treasury for giving us tax-free. Thanks to the JC, Christia van Heerden, for helping this evening, and all the fire peeps who have come through. Rand Swiss, you brought a whole bunch of people too. Uh, Viv and Gary, appreciate you this evening. Ladies and gents, thank you very much for your time.